This is certainly one of the highlights of the Hellion diesel locomotive models. The attention to detail on this, the more I look, the more I find. A very good morning to you. I hope I find you well. I'm Jennifer Kirk, welcoming you back here to the channel, to Weyard in the Loft. In today's video, I'm going to be looking at the Hellion Class 16 diesel locomotive. Now, the prototype of this was one of the pioneering modernization plan locomotives. But unlike some of the others, this is universally regarded as pretty much being the worst of the bunch. It was so unsuccessful, it didn't even get a follow on order. So there were only 10 prototypes made and they had a lifespan of only 10 years. So actually they were pretty much withdrawn uh, before some of the final steam locomotives were withdrawn that they were supposed to be replacing. But Hellion, those masters of some of the more unusual prototype models, brought a model of this out. Now it sold out actually reasonably quickly and there haven't been any more come through but a warehouse find uh, that has brought some back into stock at Rails of Sheffield has provided the opportunity for me to finally pick up one of these for my collection. So for your benefit, I'm going to be taking a good close look at this model and see how it matches up to expectations. And also in association with today's sponsor, Trainomatic, makers of DCC decoders and accessories, I'm going to be doing a full DCC fitting guide for this model towards the end of the video. So stay tuned for that. And we'll be using the Trainomatic 21 pin decoder that we recommend as the perfect fit for this model. And you can find a link to that in the description box down below. But I'm really excited to show you this. Come with me. Let's see what Hellion have for us. <laughs> Hellion very much are the masters of the unusual when it comes to making models of locomotives. They've specialised very much in some of the pioneers of the 1955 modernisation programme, including the Class 15s, Class 17s, and also a good number of other classes of locomotives, including one-offs like the Class 53. Now the Class 16 was left pretty much to last. It was the very last major BR diesel locomotive class to appear in model form. Outwardly very similar to the Class 15, also produced from the Hellion stable. It was probably considered the least successful of those early pioneering diesel classes. A batch of 10 of these was ordered from the North British Locomotive Company, but the North British Locomotive Company very, very famous from their output of steam locomotives, really couldn't quite get their heads around the new science of building diesel locomotives. So it incorporated a lot of aspects of the now outdated steam locomotive building principles, such as a heavy girder based chassis with the body sat on top. And this probably meant that the locomotive weighed a lot more than it should have done. The power plant was a Paxman unit, very similar to that one used in the Class 15, but on the Class 16, poor ventilation meant that it was much more prone to overheating, and that in turn caused seizures and uh, coolant contamination of the oil because the cylinder heads were starting to warp with that excessive heat. There were 10 of these ordered, and unlike things like the Class 15 and the Class 17, there were no follow on orders. It really was that unsuccessful that uh, even British Rail realised that these were a dead end. And pretty much it was the last gasp of the North British Locomotive Company. They failed to adjust and got superseded by other locomotive builders. Now in model form, and I'm just going to show you the uh, catalogue number on here. We've got class 16, item 16031, D8407 BR green with full yellow ends, limited edition of 750 pieces. And I believe that 
All of the different versions of the Class 16 that Hellion produced were limited to 750 pieces. Now, um, there's been one production run that I'm aware of. I know of four different versions of the Class 16, what are different examples, and these vary from early uh, production examples in the all over green uh, through to the half yellow end panels which was produced in a weathered version and also a very curious version where actually just the doors on the front ends were painted yellow but the rest remained in green it looks a bit weird and then of course the full yellow ends that you see here I'm just going to slide this out of the box and as is normal we get some fairly comprehensive instructions with these including the class history which I've touched upon a few of the details as we've gone through. Now it's interesting to note that uh, these were actually geographically quite limited based at Stratford in London. They did occasionally stretch their legs but uh, it's possibly rather meanly uh, speculated that the reason that they uh, tended to only work uh, short trips around London was simply so that they didn't have to be retrieved from far away when they broke down. We've got an exploded diagram of how the model is put together and as you can see, as is normal for the high quality, high detailed Hellion models, there are a lot of parts that go into these, but this is quite helpful. It's nice to see manufacturers showing how these are put together and these also serve a secondary purpose of just how detailed these models are with all those separately applied pieces. You try building a kit, painting it, finishing it and getting it to run reliably up to this kind of standard for the same kind of money. It really isn't something that the average model builder could do. We've also got our instructions here for getting in for DCC fitting. And I'm going to be delving into this later on in association with our sponsor Trainomatic and using the 21 pin decoder from their range. So stay tuned to the end of the video if you need to know how to DCC fit this model. Unfortunately, Hellion instructions do tend to be a little bit vague when it comes to DCC fitting, but hopefully we're going to have a great fist at doing this. Slightly unusually, this is a 21 pin chassis as opposed to the more normal 8 pin that Hellion have tended to use for a lot of their other models. Sliding it out from the internal clamshell packaging, it's very well protected in transit and what's of interest to me is whilst as you see on the underside there we do get the marker discs and uh, the couplings we don't get bags of other detail and the reason for this if I move the packaging out of the way is simply because the locomotive is factory fitted with all of that buffer beam detail front and back and that is actually quite an interesting touch. The um, couplings on there, we've got these sort of instanter three link type couplings. And I'm actually inclined to use this with um, a just an ordinary wagon and see if I can use them. Because this buffer beam detail that the model comes factory fitted with is actually so fine and exquisite. I really, really don't want to take any of it off to be able to fit the couplings. They do push into the NEM pockets that are here underneath on the bogies, front and back, so you can fit this with more conventional couplings. The other thing which immediately springs to um, our, our attention is the amount of separately fitted detail on the rest of the model. You can see those handrails on the front, the ladder for climbing up, they are all separately applied, finished in the appropriate yellow to match that full yellow end, and then we've got this catwalk on the roof, which is made of metal across the uh, air fan there. And it really is nicely done, separately applied, etched metal, painted to match the rest of the bodywork. We've got a whole multitude of extra detail down the side. There are a lot of louves on this model. Considering it suffered from poor ventilation, it does seem to have a lot more in the way of uh, air panels on the side than a lot of other models I've seen. But of course, history has proven that these did nothing to help this locomotive out. 
The livery also includes the duck egg blue on the uh, front side of the cabs. It's not on both sides, they're green facing along the longer bonnet, but for some reason they decided that the fronts would have this duck egg blue, and it actually is quite a nice colour that contrasts with the uh, British Rail Brunswick green quite nicely. We've also got separately applied horns which are fitted in there. Uh, there's only one of them on that side, but then on the other side of the cab we have one facing the other way. We also have these very, very fine windscreen wipers fitted on there, and this locomotive adopted the road switcher layout. Very common in America, but the only other example in the UK, other than the one-off prototypes, was the Class 15. And actually in the UK, all this really managed to do was give poor visibility in both directions. Looking into the cabs, we've got uh, really nice flush glazing, but unfortunately inside the cab, we have a very high raised flooring. I believe this is to uh, uh, cover over some of the mechanism, but it is quite visible through the windows and it might have been better off molded in a slightly darker color. It doesn't preclude you from painting it out. And what I would suggest is that a black paint just applied to the central part of that white floor would probably go a long way to improve the interior of the cab. There are some recesses at the side with a representation of the driver's control panel. And it may also be such that you could put a driver figure in there on both sides and that would help disguise the interior. Looking right down into there, we can also see that there is no uh, representation of the front wall of the cab, and we can see some of the wiring visible through the windows. And one of the other things that uh, strikes me with this is the weight. This is a very heavy model. There is a lot of inbuilt weight. I can feel that the running plate is a full piece of die cast metal, and that will give this an awful lot of adhesive weight. We've got the separate box underneath for the fuel tank and uh, it's fairly simplistic, but it does the job. The bogies on this as well, though, this is where this model really comes alive. We've got the correct pattern spoked wheels as per the prototype. And it's nice to see that Hellion have got those just right. We can see air all the way through those spokes and they really are a joy to look at. The rest of these fabricated bogey frames do look good with a wealth of detail. And one of the other bits, which is a really great highlight for me, is those brake blocks, they line up with the wheel treads. That is very, very pleasing to see and gives you that much greater depth, the 3D effect to those bogies, which on certain other models has felt to be a bit lacking where these have been molded as part of the bogey frames. All in all, the outward look of this model really is nice. We've got a representation of what looks to be a fan down there. Certainly the grill that's underneath is really finely detailed. There's a lot of use of separately fitted metal parts on these, and it really does look good. Looking on the end there, we've got some really nice printing, the overhead warning stripes there. And also we've got the red circle to do with the multiple working. It has fully functional directional lighting, and I just love the ends of this locomotive. The detail is exquisite. Red finished buffer beam is crisply done, and that buffer beam detail is really nice and well applied. We've also got the appropriate curve to those buffer heads, and the buffers are all sprung loaded. Looking down the side of the model, the cab is actually removable as a separate piece if you want to gain access inside there to add a crew. I really do like this duck egg blue on the front. It does look good. The BR Totem is really nicely done. Again, crisp and sharp, plus that overhead warning flash. These louvres and the uh, separately applied metal handrails are really, really good. And it does give this model a distinctive appearance that sets it apart from the Class 15. Looking to the other end of the model, again, direction control lights, overhead warning flash, and also that uh, ladder work as well. That is exquisite. I love it. I really do absolutely love it. It's such attention to detail. They could quite easily have been done as a molded on item, but actually having them as separately applied metal 
so improves this model. One of the other areas that I really do like are these little handrails here that go along with the uh, climbing points so that a crew could get up and get onto the uh, running board to gain access into these uh, access panel doors. This is separately applied and it really is nice. It seems to be some kind of springy plastic. It's the same both sides, but it really is a great effect. Livery wise, these locomotives were very limited. They had an operational life of barely 10 years and quite often they were being scrapped at the same time as the steam locomotives that they were supposed to replace. They were not successful. And they certainly never lasted long enough to acquire the BR double arrow, TOPS data panels, or even all over rail blue. Really, what you see is what you get. You get this livery. And really, the only variance on the livery is the yellow ends. They started out without them, then they gained half yellow ends, and finally full yellow ends. But actually, even though this is somewhat of a dinosaur of that modernization age where money was shoveled at the railways with the political motive of trying to effectively subsidize the domestic locomotive building market, but in a way that really only served to just waste huge amounts of public money without any real gain for it, the model is an item of beauty. I'm really actually quite pleased to have got hold of these they sold out completely a while back, and I haven't seen them in the shops for quite some time. But a warehouse find has enabled Rails of Sheffield to bring a few examples of these back to the market, and I swooped in to pick this one up. At the time of filming, all bar one example are now completely sold out. They only found a few examples of each, and it's testament actually to just how beautiful these models are that they've sold out very, very quickly this second time around. I've spoken with Hellion about whether they might consider doing another production run of these, and they said that they have no immediate plans. For what is actually quite a niche locomotive, I guess there is a worry that another full production run might not find buyers for every example, and that's not really helpful to Hellion or to model shops alike. So for now, if you don't manage to get one of these from the uh, Rails of Sheffield warehouse find sale, then really your only other option is to look out for one second hand. But really, you're not going to be disappointed. This is certainly one of the highlights of the Hellion diesel locomotive models. I would actually rate this as certainly being a better model than the Class 15, the Class 26, the Class 27, and even the Class 33. The attention to detail on this, the more I look, the more I find. The prototype might have been an absolute lemon, but the model is anything but. So we come now to the DCC fitting, and uh, I've got my trusty jeweler's screwdrivers. And I've also got the Trainomatic 21 pin DCC decoder. You'll find a link to their UK distributors in the description box down below. And this is the decoder that we recommend for this model. Now I'm also going to be referring to the instructions that come with this that give some clue on how it goes together. So you can see there it does suggest removing the cab, but I know from experience with the Class 15 model that that, whilst it did recommend the cab removal on that as well, I have been told it isn't strictly necessary. So I'm going to leave it in place and just go straight on to the next stage of the process. With the crosshead small jeweler screwdriver, we've got four screws on this, on the front side of both of the bogies. So I'm just going to loosen those off. These are in very, very tight. When we put them back in, just make sure that we don't over torque these up and turn the model around. Again, we've got two more at this end and a final one. Just be careful not to uh, scrub the front side of the bogies with the screwdriver. 
and then the whole body actually very very easily just slides up and away and I'm just checking in there there are no attached wires so we don't have to worry about snagging wires and as you can see it is not strictly necessary to remove the top of the cab so I'm just going to put that to one side and then we can see inside the model that we do actually have plenty of space so if we wanted to sound fit one of these then uh, it's got plenty of room at the front for fitting the speaker setup and uh, allowing the sound to escape via that uh, very very fine grill in the roof. On the top of the printed circuit board you'll find the DCC blanking socket and what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the large flathead screwdriver just to very carefully rock this loose. Don't try and pull it all the way up from one side only. You need to very very carefully just loosen it one side then the other and just gently rock it backwards and forwards until you feel it let go and just come free. So that's just our DCC blanking plate and then we go to the Trainomatic 21 pin decoder and we're just going to have to make sure that we get this the right way round. So on the actual uh, decoder you can see there at the top when finger is there's the single pin hole out on its own and uh, we just need to make sure that that all lines up very very gently pressure evenly applied and get it down into place and then that's all we need to do what I'll do now is quickly check it on the programming track, just read back the number. On the programming track, if there's any kind of a problem, then that will let you know without running the risk of blowing the decoder. It's always a great technique to uh, get into the habit of doing. Once you're happy that all is well, it's just simply a case of getting that body back on. And what I'm really, really pleased about is how easy it is to get the body on and off this locomotive. So we just line it up and just gently slide the body back into place and it very positively locates back home. Go back to our small crosshead jeweler screwdriver and just gently tighten up the four screws. And there we have it, our fully DCC fitted class 16 diesel locomotive. It's a pleasure when locomotives are that easy to DCC fit. When it came to running, that weight really does provide a lot of adhesion to this locomotive. It negotiated all of the point work that I threw at it with the greatest of ease. It managed gradients too, with no sign of slippage as well. And um, once I got around that buffer beam detail and got it to pull a train, it really did seem to have nothing that would stop it. This will pull a very prototypical length train if not beyond because of that immense amount of low down die cast metal that has gone into its construction. It really was a reliable runner and just kept on chugging unlike the prototype that it's modelled after. We turn now to the scores. First up is build quality and really the build quality on this is really really good. Despite all that fine detail, it does seem to be pretty robust and it stood up to handling throughout this review without any parts coming off or coming loose, so I'm really pleased with that. The amount of detail that's gone into this locomotive is immense. I'm particularly impressed by those bogies and also the handrails and footholds that are on the ends of the locomotive. Again, they're made of wire, so they are very, very robust. So on build quality, I'm going to give this a 9.9 .9 out of 10. When it comes to running quality, again, the locomotive ran really, really well. That die cast running plate gives a lot of low down adhesive weight. And that means that this locomotive really can just romp away with anything that you care to throw at it. So 
I was really pleased it went through point work without any issue. The wheel back to backs out of the box are great and it handled twisted track, gradients, you name it, I threw it at this. The only thing that was a little bit difficult to do was to get it to pull a train without having to remove some of this buffer beam detail. And in the end, I did manage to fudge it by using the uh, couplings that come with it, but it wasn't ideal and I didn't manage to get that on camera. So overall, I'm going to give this a 9.8 out of 10. On DCC fitting and innovation, this model does come with directional marker lights, which are really, really good. I like the way that they fade in and out. They're not just on or off. They have a real feel of being an incandescent bulb. Inside the body, there is plenty of space, although it doesn't seem to be set up specifically to take a sound decoder and uh, speaker. The space is there nonetheless. And I don't think that this would be a difficult proposition for a decent sized bass speaker and sound decoder. I think there's also a lot of space in here for a Stay Alive too. Not that it felt like this locomotive was in need of one. Getting the body off was a doddle. Those four screws gave it a good positive hold, but there was no need to actually mess about to lift the body off. One thing I would say is that the instructions suggested that the cab needed to come off to remove the body. I can confirm that that's not the case. The only reason you'd really need to remove the cab is if you were going to put a crew in there or paint out that very obvious white raised floor. So actually, DCC fitting this model is even easier than the instructions suggest it to be. Fitting in that 21 pin decoder was absolutely yeah, child's play. There's plenty of room for it and I had no problems whatsoever. So I'm going to give this a 9.8 out of 10. On accuracy and quality of finish, this model really does score well. There might not be a wealth of different livery options on these, but the livery it comes with is very well applied. Quite often, all over Brunswick green can be well, a bit of a boring colour, but Hellion have managed to breathe so much life into this livery application. From all of the details on the bearing boxes on the bogies, the extra detail on the sole bar where we've got uh, some extra printing on there. And when you get really close, it does look nice, although I'm not quite sure what those gold impressions are on the sole bar, but actually they do work really well. We've also got some suggestion of writing on the uh, actual uh, bearing box covers. But then when we get to the rest of the application, these louvers really come out nicely. We've got the separate white handles on some of those access doors. And then we get the overhead warning flashes, which are really sharp and crisp, as is the British Railways totem. We don't get any TOPS data panels. None of these locomotives in reality ever had them applied. But the D8407 is really sharp and crisp. And we've got that very characteristic diamond-shaped North British locomotives work panel underneath, which is really nicely reproduced. All in all, this livery application really does bring the best out in this locomotive despite the fact that it could have been quite a boring finish, Hellion have avoided all of the pitfalls. And I'm going to give this a 9.5 out of 10. When it comes to value for money, you do get a lot of locomotive for your pound. They're really hard to find at the moment. Indeed, if it wasn't for that unexpected warehouse find, I think these just wouldn't be on the market. But I think it was around £140, the RRP for these models and you do get a lot of model for that. It's a powerful motor. It's got plenty of space inside for a sound fitting, stay alive if that's what you want, but that doesn't compromise its adhesive weight. That die cast running plate, we keep coming back to that. It really does make this model a sterling performer. So for value for money, I'm going to give this a 9.5 out of 10. And that gives us a final score of a really, really great 48.5 out of 50. Can I recommend this model? Yes, I certainly can. It might not have been a locomotive that was on my radar at all before these turned up as a warehouse find. 
but now I've bought one, I am so pleased that I have, and it's rapidly becoming one of my favourite diesel outline locomotives on Weir Yard. Really pleased to have been able to add this to my fleet, and if you get the opportunity to pick up one of these models, you won't be disappointed. Well, I hope you really enjoyed that video and that it was informative to you. Don't forget to tickle that like button and also share this video on social media. Let other people know about the channel. And if you haven't already done so, do please consider subscribing and ringing that bell so that you'll be the first to know about new videos as and when they go up. But until next time, this is me, Jenny Cook, saying take great care of yourself. Happy modelling. Bye for now. Today's video is sponsored by Trainomatic, makers of DCC decoders designed to be fully compatible with every manufacturer's locomotive. Visit train-o-matic.com to browse the full range and see what they've got suitable for you. I'd like to send out a huge thanks to everybody who supports me on Patreon. And an extra special huge thanks goes out to Anthony Kidson, Offshore Allen, oorail.co.uk, Michael Lockie, Helen Sink, Peter Bolton, Brian and Dorothy Mudd, Gary Lewis, David Quinn, Sparky107107, George Botterini, Andy Finch, Chris Moss, Robert Steers, MD of San Juan Model Company and Grantline Products, Sam Yates, Dale Williams, John N. from NC, NYMRish, Jonathan Foster, Peter, and Graham Foster. Thank you. Without you guys, I couldn't do this.